start recording. And now uh, Mark Paley, Director of Administration and Finance at Himes Foundation, you have the floor. And again, uh, just for the recording, I'll just say the uh, questions again. Uh, can you talk about portfolio theory? What hypothesis learning are you exploring around the risk and benefits of local investing versus public equities? From a foundation perspective, how has the coronavirus pandemic affected your grant making and how has it affected your endowment? And what are the difficult choices foundations have to make now? And I give you the floor, Mark. Thank you, Nia. It's really great to be here and um, sharing what my experiences have been at the foundation. Um, we are, you, many of you may have heard of HIAMS, or we, we're one of the few foundations that really focus on trying to support the grassroots organizing groups in Boston and Chelsea and um, have been doing that for nearly a hundred years. Um, so, and my role is, um, as the title says, administration and finance, basically everything but program. But I also am involved with mission investing. So that's really exciting over the past few years is really getting involved with the connection between the program grant making side and the investment and mission related investments and program related investments. So I'll take a crack at these questions and, um, and we'll see if there's any questions that come out after that. So portfolio theory, basically my understanding is that um, you, you, you invest in a, different types of investments. Ivy probably knows this really well. Um, in uh, assets, um, equities, debt, um, loan, you know, borrow, lending money, or there's different kinds of um, equity investments with the public stock or private investments. And the, the idea is that you sort of spread your money in different places because different things will make money in different in economic environments. Some environments, you lose money no matter where you put it. But the idea is that you um, diversify your investments so that hopefully one type of investment will make money while another one may lose a little bit. Um, so it's a balancing act. And um, my sense is that it was developed you know, for foundations, which have a lot of money, usually. Um, and um, it, it feeds on that part of the economy and that large endowments, um, you know, some are billions of dollars, they can invest in all sorts of different things. I've also been introduced to something called the movement portfolio theory that Aaron Tanaka and others have put together, which is taking that theory and adding the social return in, in, on top of the um, um, financial return. And you know, what if we had a theory that said how to make money, but also how to help the community? Um, so that's, that's something that uh, you know, interests me. I've seen presentations on it, um, and it, it's, it's, I think it's a growing I hope it, that it grows into um, a developed thing that's adopted widely. Um, and I'll answer the next question about risks and benefits of local investing versus public equities. Um, my sense is public equities, a lot of investing, you're betting on the company. Um, the local investing and in the way that Ujima invests and why Hyams is, is supportive of that is because it's really integral to our mission of um, racial supporting racial justice in Boston and Chelsea. And so it's a way for us to put our money invested in a way that is completely tied with our mission. Um, so the risk is that, um, you know, I see it as we share the risk with the community. Um, if, you know, we put money in and it, is great, then we benefit also along with the community. If something you know doesn't go as well, then we would share the risk. And I think that's appropriate. And um, we're looking at how to do that more. Um, how COVID has affected our grant making. That's 
a lot of foundations in HIAMS too, we've totally focused on COVID related needs in the community. There's a lot of funds that came up that we supported and we, our goal was to really get important money out quickly, thinking that it was really important to fund these funds immediately. So what we did was we, um, we, we short-circuited our system somewhat. We didn't go through as much detailed review as we um, normally would. Um, the, and the goal was to make things easier for the funds to accept that. So if we heard of a fund, if we knew the people, we know that their values are the same as ours, it was easy to give a grant. And um, it was done in a way where the staff made the decision another way of making that faster and more streamlined. Um, other things that we've done is um, for some organizations, we had um, two year grants. And so we paid out the second year sooner than we normally would have. Um, again, recognizing that the resources are really um, valuable now um, and that they can use the money more more than we can use it for, you know, in our endowment growing. Um, and we also um, turned some grants from program grants or project grants into general operating grants. Again, making it more streamlined and um, encouraging and listening to the grantees when they're saying that, you know, they we want them to have to hop through fewer hoops, particularly in this time. So not have to give out detailed reports on that, not to have to give detailed um, applications in some cases. Um, so that, you know, that, that, that shifted a lot of how we um, got money out in the immediate um, environment. I don't know what's gonna come. No one knows what's gonna come. Um, some of these things, you know, I think people are saying, you know, maybe some of these things that we're doing will adopt as regular operating. Um, and we've talked about um, streamlining grants and um, making the applications an easier process, making the reporting an easier process, because really um, the goal is to get the work done, not to tell the foundation what we're doing in our format. Um, so those, those are a lot of the things that we've been working on. And the other thing going forward, our endowment is dropping like everyone else's. Um, and we don't even know what the effect is going to be. We're on a calendar year. So our 2020 budget is set. The board has um, said that we're not going to cut that budget. Um, but our spending is based on a percentage of the budget of the endowment going forward. And so, you know, the same percentage on fewer dollars means we have fewer dollars to use for grant making and for our own operating that it takes to run the organization. So we're just beginning to explore what that means for HIAMS, but we know it's gonna mean that we have fewer dollars. Um, we're gonna try to keep grants, you know, that's priority, that's what we do. It's supporting the groups. We're also looking at activities that are not grant um, led, other non-grant activities that HIAMS can help um, organize groups, organize trainings, um, gatherings, things like that, um, use our, um, our position in the community to um, you know, further the mission. I wasn't keeping track of time, but... Um, it was pretty impressive. I think you're probably two minutes under Mark, um, and that's perfect. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep us going just to make sure um, everyone gets time, and then we have some time uh, for questions. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. And I want to encourage everyone as you're listening, anything that you're hearing, if you if you have questions, also please put them in the chat. Jenny said you did great, Mark. Um, please put them uh, in the chat because, again, just in case we can't get to your question, it would just be great to have the, the question noted, um, and then we can we can think about how we send out answers to that uh, later. Uh, so next, I'm going to go to Ivy. 
um, first, I'm going to put uh, the questions in the in the chat that we've put to Ivy. Um, so one will be, as I've, as I've said, similar, uh, which is uh, portfolio theory. And then we did ask uh, uh, some things that we think are unique to what Ivy does. Uh, so really quickly, Ivy Jack is uh, head of equity research at North Star uh, Asset Management. And um, the questions we like uh, Ivy to take the floor on are, can you talk about uh, portfolio theory? Um, what kind of guidance between, uh, what kind of guidance would you give? Um, understanding that you can't get a, give advice, but I'm sure you'll let us know that. Uh, but what kind of guidance would you give uh, between diversification between the market and local? Um, what kind of guidance would you give for people who right now are thinking, huh, you know, maybe this is a good opportunity to get in. Prices prices are low, so I should I should probably jump in now. And what's it like um, being an RIA in this moment? And I'll give you the well, floor. And then, as I said, you can decide how you'd like to allocate time between those uh, questions. So let me quickly say um, what I do. So I work at North Star Asset Management. Uh, we are a progressive wealth management firm. Uh, our clients are high net worth individuals. Um, and we were founded by Julie Goodridge, who won same sex marriage rights here in Massachusetts in 2004. Um, and I typically bring that up because it is, I think, uh, at the core, uh, who we are and how we view the world um, in terms of being activists. And also in terms of um, if you go to our website and, and look at uh, our firm, it's 14 of us, so 13 women, um, and we have one man. Um, and we are women. <laughs> we are women of different uh, races and ethnicities and different sexual orientations. And so, um, and, and that is certainly intentional because we want to embody our mission as well um, and who we are. But with that being said, our, our you know, reason for existence is that we, we do manage money for clients who have a high net worth and for clients who um, I would say have a different perspective on the world and how they see the world. And um, I am going to speak from the perspective of a black woman, I, I am. Um, I think for people who live at the margins of society, we see the world in a very different light than other people do. So with that, I'm going to take my some of the questions, it says explain portfolio theory, uh, diversity within and across asset classes. I think Mark did a wonderful job. Um, my spin, or I would say is portfolio theory is one of many theories for people who study finance. Um, portfolio theory, modern portfolio theory was, uh, it, it, it was a theory that was Harry Markowitz, who is an American economist, who is a white male, came up with this way of thinking about how do we put portfolios together so that in addition to maximizing your return, we also minimize risk. And one of the ways that you can do that or, or that Markowitz thought we should think about that is that if you have a portfolio and you have different types of assets in your portfolio that essentially Overall, by having that kind of diversification, you lower your risk. Um, so that would be my quick explanation on portfolio theory. One thing I will say is that portfolio theory, like many other theories in finance and, e and e economics, um, the assumptions don't take into account several things. So for example, in terms of modern portfolio theory, Harry Markowitz assumes that all people are rational. Well, you and I both all know that people don't act rationally. Um, he assumes that there are not any externalities related to the environment. So he doesn't take into account that in order to make money, you know, some people are comfortable poisoning our lakes and streams. Um, you know, he, he assumes that when someone is hiring, that they are going to hire the best person for the job, no matter what that person looks like. Now, all of us know that that is not necessarily true. Um, so again, a theory makes all of these assumptions, but um, in my mind, sometimes I wonder, you know, a theory that's based on people being rational and, you know, not necessarily having profit as front and center, 
makes me question how valuable sometimes it is. But with that being said, nonetheless, that is what Markowitz had in mind. Uh, guidance on diversification between market and local. Uh, let me just step back and say all of our clients at North Star are typically invested. There is a public equities portion of their portfolio. So that means for the most part, all of our clients have some portion of their money in the market. They also have some portion of their money in fixed income and so bonds and those bonds are typically um, treasuries or agencies. And then we also encourage our clients to think about how to put their money to work in a way that mirrors their values. And in that case, there is a host of investments are, are things that we offer our clients um, and it could be a community loan fund, um, you know, things like Ujima, um, other types of CDF, CDFIs um, that are known for investing locally. Um, so that's also another uh, area that we encourage our clients. We also encourage our clients to have a giving plan. So, um, you know, every year we actually sit down and, and work with our clients to say, you know, what are the things that you value? You know, what are the organizations, charitable organizations that you want to give funds to? Um, again, in line with uh, your values and also, I would say, in terms of North Star, things that we care about, all of our values, um, race and gender, uh, income inequality, human rights. And so no matter what uh, investment you're in, we encourage all of our clients to think and think deeply about how, um, how you spend your money, how it's impacting not just you, but the economy in general and other people. Uh, let me quickly, guidance for people who want to buy the, oops, it moved up, who want to buy the dip. Um, I, I, when, I, when I read this, I'm thinking of kind of that old saying, you know, uh, buy low, sell high. Um, what I say there is that's easier said than done. So I typically at this point, take the opportunity to remind people that um, investing in, there, there are a lot of people who spend their lives investing in the stock market. Um, while I encourage anybody to learn about the market, I would say that certainly um, it is not a hobby. So um, again, I, I just, I, I, I caution people to be, be cautious, certainly if you're interested. You know, I, I tell, you know, all people, if you're interested, you know, pick a name that you're interested in, follow it. But uh, please understand that um, there's a whole segment of people who spend their lives studying theories that like Harry Markowitz came up with, who think about the best way to protect assets. So, um, and then the last question is, what is it like being in RA at this moment? I'm going to take this and say from North Star's perspective, um, we are very uh, hands-on with our clients. Uh, so we're going to always have a perspective on the market, but our perspective is always viewed through that particular client's concerns. So there is no, I would say, one message that I send to everybody because, um, yes, we will, like I said, at North Star have a perspective on the market, but I think at the core of who we are, um, you know, our clients are like family. And so when our clients have questions about the market, it's not necessarily just a question about the market. It's our job to sit down, talk with them and really understand okay, what are your concerns. Um, and so with that being said, what is it like? I would say right now, um, this is an interesting time because even though for the most part, we have been with our clients for, you know, a long, long, long time. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We typically don't lose clients. So um, we know our clients very well, but uh, I always say, you know, when things are uncertain um, and not the best, that is when you get to know people really well. And so um, I would say I look at this as an opportunity to get even closer to our clients um, and to reassure them in the ways that are relevant to whatever their concerns are. That's it. Excellent. Thank you, Ivy. And uh, just to note, there was a question in the chat from Jenny, but we'll get to it after Drew. But Jenny asked, what's considered high net worth? So just, just noting that and that's in the chat. Uh, so um, thank you once again so much, Ivy. 
Uh, next, we have Drew Smith, uh, who is with uh, uh, the City of Boston, Head of Treasury at the City of Boston. And uh, Drew, um, I'm going to put the questions that we had for you in the chat. Also, if you if you um, think it's appropriate to talk about portfolio theory, for example, if there's something that's different from, from your perspective, given your position, um, invite you to do that first. And then what we've asked is, um, how is the city managing treasuries? Has the market fluctuations influenced any new thinking for how the city might invest? And we know that the city is already moving on uh, ESG efforts, environment, social governance, and you know, and maybe kind of touch on that just really quickly for for those of us who um, might be hearing that for the first time. But the city is already moving on ESG efforts. Um, how are those accelerated or slowed or changed back on the moment? Uh, okay. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm probably going to leave the answer on portfolio theory with um, Avi and Mark. I think they did a great job. I mean, you know, from our perspective, I will say that, uh, you know, we are, our, um, it's all about, as they had mentioned, maximizing return within a limited amount of risk. So that's something that we work on all the time. Uh, let me give you a little bit of context. The city of Boston manages the city of Boston proper, uh, not the retirement system manages uh, funds in buckets. So we manage the cash investment portfolio, which is essentially our liquid operating funds. Um, we are pretty constrained with how we manage that. Uh, we also manage uh, the assets of approximately 300 municipal trusts. Uh, the value of those total um, just over $800 million. Those are held in, uh, it's less restrictive, but it's held in traditional equity fixed income real estate type securities. Uh, so that's what we do uh, And that. Let me look and um, okay. So as far as how we are managing treasuries, uh, so we're really not. And the reason is, is the city doesn't really purchase direct treasuries normally. Um, we hold, so this would be generally on the cash management side of things. Uh, the city holds its funds in either um, banks, uh, Mass, the MMDT, the Massachusetts Municipal Depository Trust, which is run very similarly and, and acts uh, very much like a traditional money market fund. Uh, we have a number of traditional money market funds uh, where we keep our bond proceeds. Uh, and then we also um, recently invested approximately $300 million uh, with uh, PFM asset advisors uh, in a separately managed account and with the mandate that they take half of that money and invest it in such a way that it's only invested in companies that have strong ESG practices. So that's part of um, what we're doing on the ESG front. Uh, we have, I, I will say that um, kind of in response to what's going on in the market from a treasury side of things, uh, it is more important to us now than ever before. And it's always been pretty important that we diversify our funds, um, even the short-term cash has to be diversified between banks. I don't care if they're all FDIC covered. I don't care if they're all you know, collateralized with letters of credit from the Federal Home Loan Bank. Um, we are working to make sure that we diversify that money across banks. We also want to diversify it across product types. Uh, so that's you know, not only MMDT, but various money market funds. And then also that's one of the reasons we're really excited about what we're doing with PFM is because it allows us to um, diversify into not just an investment management firm, but individual securities that we maintain individual registered ownership of. So that helps us diversify our portfolio further. And as the city's cash portfolio gets larger, uh, I think that that becomes even more important. Um, you know, as I've said before, we've got approximately at any given time, uh, $1.5 billion in investable cash. And it's harder than you might think to make sure that that's placed and diversified appropriately. Uh, from uh, the equity side of things, as it relates to what's going on with the pandemic, we are very careful about rebalancing the portfolio and kind of getting back. And I know Avi and Mark will know a lot about this, but rebalancing the portfolios to make sure we get back to our original allocation several times a year. Uh, it is, you know, the last thing you want to do in a market like this, you know, some would say, uh, I would tend to agree, the last thing you want to do is sell after you've already lost quite a bit. Um, one of the things we've been doing is, uh, 
making sure that we don't overreact to kind of what's going on right now and that we just kind of keep a steady hand on it and make sure that we increase the frequency of those rebalancings. Uh, so that's one of the ways that we're uh, managing the assets on the trust side of things. As far as, let me go back up here. Okay, what we're doing with ESG. You know, we started, we have put, um, uh, we have updated the city's trust investment policy uh, to include ESG as a secondary objective. So to the extent that we're able to kind of meet our primary fiduciary uh, requirements, then to the extent that there's a secondary objective, it's certainly ESG. But when we go out uh, and add new fund managers uh, and conduct diligence visits with them, one of the first questions we ask is how they view ESG investing, how they incorporate into that portfolio. Um, the best managers give the best answers. And those answers are not only is that the right thing to do, but also we believe that companies that have strong ESG practices are inherently more sustainable over the long term. So that's gonna work out better for you. Uh, as I said, about two and a half years ago, I came onto the treasury about two and a half years ago. So did our CFO, Emma Handy. We were only separated by about a month. And one of the first conversations we had, understanding that the mayor's really called for us to be as creative as possible, to do as much good as we can with the tools that we have. Um, you know, we looked around and we said, well, with one and a half billion dollars, surely to God, there's something you can do with that money besides just earn a positive return. Uh, while you kind of meet your objectives of earning that return, surely that provides us some leverage to do some good. That's how we came up with the ESG um, idea uh, to invest the cash balances in, in using this objective metric provided by Sustainalytics uh, to ascertain whether or not a company has strong ESG practices. That's trucking along great. Um, it, we uh, started investing uh, money in that fund in November of 2019. We got everything in the market. Uh, our goal now is to go ahead and diversify that among industries. So get more into various corporate notes as opposed to just financials, which is the bulk of what you have on the short end of the curve. So if you're dumping $300 million in the market, that's kind of where you have to put it uh, in the short term. And then we're working on diversifying that out. We actually just had a meeting with um, that fund manager today, we got an update on kind of how everything's doing, it's doing great. So we continue to move forward with that. Uh, you know, if anything, what we're trying to do around generating ideas for how we can be ESG conscious and incorporate that to our investment portfolios is just sped up. It's certainly not slowed down with what's going on with the pandemic. Uh, so I guess uh, those would be my answers. I'm happy to answer any additional questions you might have, but I think I covered most of what you have here. Great, thank you, Drew. And you did have a you did have a question specifically for you. So I, I believe I've seen three questions uh, so far. And so let's see let's see how we do with that in time. We're at RAS seven nineteen. We're officially over, but we did start the presentation later. Um, and and uh, Antonio, I don't know if you want to say anything. I, I muted you because I could hear the wind. Uh, but I guess kind of signal if you if you want to say something. But um, so the first question was from Jenny. This was for Ivy, which was, if I try to go back up, it's what what's considered high net worth. Uh, then for Drew, Louise asked, what are municipal trust funds? And then Claudia asked, and I think this is for all three of you. Claudia asked, I'm curious as to what your orgs have stopped doing during this time and how do you see that scaling into the future? And so why don't we start with Ivy with what's considered high net worth? And then Ivy has a question for Drew. <laughs> and I figured, I the, I figured you all might have <laughs> questions for each other. <laughs> uh, I hate this question because what's high net worth? High net worth is different people, different things for different people. But unfortunately at North Star for us, high net worth is 2.5 million. Great. Right. Thank you. And then Drew, what's, uh, what are municipal trust funds? I'm glad you asked the question, Louise. Um, so uh, municipal trust funds are essentially just separate funds, kind of um, a part of the city's financial system, but somewhat separate. Uh, the city of Boston is old, 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 as you know. And so um, in many cases back in the 1700s and 1800s, when people uh, uh, with quite a bit of money would pass, um, it wasn't uncommon for them to will a certain amount of money to the city. Uh, and ask that that money be held in trust and invested in perpetuity um, to benefit whatever it was they were interested in in life. Maybe it's the park system, maybe it's caring for the poor. So it's our job to make sure that we invest that money and spit off income 
and then use that income, that annual distribution to kind of accomplish those goals. Um, we are in the process of building out the trust division site because there's a lot of cool stories. Um, we had Benjamin Franklin money at one time. We've, uh, we have, like I said, 300 trusts. Some of them date back to the seven, 1700s. So that's what that is. Some of the trust, uh, Louise, are not um, testamentary trusts that are bequeathed. Some of them are just trusts that the city council has, uh, that the city council have, or members of the city council have, have adopted to carry out uh, various city objectives, maybe the neighborhood housing trust, the neighborhood jobs trust, things like that. And my, uh, the question on, when we look at outside members, uh, it's a great question. So we work with NEPC, who's our consultant. The way we do that, is, or the way we select a, a new manager when it comes up is that NEPC can um, an initial kind of global search from uh, the providers that they've already conducted diligence visits on. And then they present us with a list of options. And then we have a meeting about, you know, kind of the attributes of each of those firms. I'll tell you, um, those meetings are ranging discussions and they touch on everything. It's not just, um, well, this is how the manager invests and this is what he thinks about return and, or this is what she, you know, how she feels about uh, diversification. Uh, the meetings are about this is how they handle teammates. This is how they handle diversity. This is, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about different things that we think could be, um, uh, you know, a real positive for the fund manager that gives them additional kind of perspective that we think will help them in, in kind of doing what they're doing. Uh, you know, the, I know that a lot of us heard about the controversy recently with Fisher Investments. Uh, in some of the comments, and I don't know that it was, it was that recent, it's been about a year ago, but about a lot of the comments that he made, I know that um, the city trust funds didn't have any money, uh, but the Boston retirement system did, they divested of that. Uh, the mayor said in his letter that it's just not in line with our values. And I believe he said, he even um, indicated that it raises a real question about the culture of the organization. Um, and that type of mindset could bleed over into a lot of different aspects of the work. So. Um, any organization, from my perspective, any organization that doesn't value diversity and doesn't value a lot of the ESG principles that are important to us, um, that may say something about the organization. It's something we have to keep an eye on. So it does come into play, but it's not the primary objective, or it's not the primary consideration. Then, Drew, so um, I'm going to allow time for three more minutes. I'm, I'm sorry, three more questions, and then we'll wrap. So Ivy had a follow-up question to your question, uh, or to your response, Drew, which is, have you looked at the demographics of your consultant? Um, and then Ant Antonio asked, and I think this is probably what, any one of you could answer this, but Antonio asked, what is ESG? I believe he is asking, what's ESG? And then finally, that last question um, from Claudia, uh, what have your org stopped doing? Uh, and let me just make sure I'm reading that question right. And how do you see that scaling into the future? And and just I guess for some extra context, uh, Claudia is thinking of uh, Mark's comments on how Himes, for example, um, has start has has talked about streamlining grants. And so there's there's some process things that they've changed. Uh, so I think that's the context of her question when she asked, "What have your org stopped doing?" So follow up, Drew. Have you looked at the demographics of your consultant? Um, and then any one of you, what's ESG? Uh, and then finally, um, is there anything that your orgs have stopped doing uh, right now that you see kind of uh, expanding in, into the future? Uh, so, so I'll hop in quickly. Oops. Please go ahead, Avi. Yeah. I'll hop in quickly. ESG, uh, E is for environmental, S is for social, G is for governance. Um, I, I don't know. It, at the beginning of when I started talking, I was saying, you know, um, you know, when Henry Markowitz came up with his portfolio theory, there were things that he didn't consider. So, you know, again, he didn't consider whether or not if someone was holding an asset or making a profit that resulted in, um, you know, polluting the pond. Whereas we now, we've evolved and we now recognize that, um, you know, yes, it's, it's okay, you know, maybe to make a profit, but if you're making a profit while poisoning all the rest of us, I'm not really sure um, you know, whether you're making a profit is a good idea. And so ESG is now recognizing that it's just not okay to make a profit. So you have, we have to be good stewards of our environment. 
Um, it also, in terms of social, um, it means, you know, their human rights. There are certain things people are entitled to. Um, you, you know, um, I, I think for us at North Star, that S is very important. And, you know, which is why I said we try to embody that S um, because, Look, hey, I, I started my career on Wall Street. I can tell you right now, most of the people I've worked with my entire life don't look anything like me. Um, and I do think that when you have different people at a firm, when it comes to um, generating ideas, um, and just in general in terms of um, building up a community per se, that it does matter um, what, what people look like. Um, so that's, you know, the S and by the way, not just what people look like, but also it does matter how you treat your employees. Um, that is one of the first things that we look at when we invest in public equities. Um, and then in terms of the G, good governance. Um, I think, you know, and I'll just step out here and say this, that we're living in an environment right now where I do think it is important that we um, advocate and champion for good governance, which means transparency. You know, we need to hold our leaders accountable. Um, and so that's, that's the G and if you want, I mean, I'm more than happy to go offline and, and give you more details behind the E, the S and the G. But again, it's just a recognition now that it's not just about making a profit. Those other things matter as well. Uh, and I'll jump Thank in. Thank you, Ivy. I can jump in quickly and answer the question about the consultant. So um, the consultant as a vendor, just like all vendors, it's actually selected as a part of um, an RFP process. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I haven't looked at that. The last RFP was done before I got here. Uh, so I haven't looked at the original RFP that selected them. Um, that RFP is, I'd have to go back and look at the calendar, but it's coming up before too long. I will say that I know that this mayor has made um, with the signing of his executive order and just um, an understanding in City Hall of how things are done uh, has made a real priority on diversity and selecting vendors. Uh, so I have zero doubt at all that that is going to be uh, incorporated into the RFP process uh, when we actually do go select them again. Excellent. Thank you so much. And then final question, if it applies, um, anything that your orgs have stopped doing right now or or changed that you think will kind of will continue into the future. It'll expand. It'll scale up. So Mark talked about perhaps streamlining uh, some grants may continue beyond this moment, for example. But that's something that I'm just doing right now. Yeah, and we this is a sort of a continuation of things that we've started doing even before COVID about um, seeing, looking at our processes and the, doing the minimum that w required for us and recognizing that, you know, that nonprofits work hard at getting foundation grants. They write uh, proposals thinking about how we're going to read it. They write reports about, you know, detailed um, just for those foundations. One of the things we do sometimes is allow a grantee to give us a report that they've already written to someone else. It's the same work, um, or we've talked about, um, you know, maybe even just a conversation because um, we know we recognize that people put a lot of time into it that we would rather that they spend on organizing or managing their organization or maybe seeking other funds. Um, so we don't have a game plan going forward of exactly what we're going to be doing going in the, into the future, but my sense is that we're going to maintain the focus on what the nonprofits are doing and see how we can work with them rather than having them just feed us information. Nia, you probably know it from the from the grantee point of view. Absolutely. So I typed in, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it's, def it's, it's definitely much appreciated uh, when, when, when funders are, are kind of thinking about, um, yeah, uh, what, what we might be doing multiple times over. So hopefully that holds. Um, here I will wrap us because I do see that uh, some people have joined for our time breaking team meeting. Um, one, thank you so much, uh, Drew. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you, Mark. 
Um, I know Ivy mentioned uh, she's willing to talk about ESG offline. So I don't know if you want to, uh, this is going on our YouTube channel, remembering that, but I don't know if you, if you would like us to put your contact information um, in the chat. If so, you, you can go ahead and kind of get it in there really quickly in that. We'll, we'll keep it moving and we'll try to, if, if anyone reaches out to us with any questions for any one of you specifically, we'll make sure we connect you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, this was, this was uh, fantastic. And uh, we encourage everyone, if, you, if this is kind of processing still and you have some questions, um, please do not hesitate, email us the questions. And again, we'll try to uh, get them to the right person um, and, and, and connect you. Um, all right, so Ivy has put in uh, North Star's uh, website, northstarasset.com. And I will just shout out, a Antonio um, asked in the chat, how does this benefit POC communities engaging and hearing the needs of communities? Antonio has put his phone number uh, and email. Oh, oh, that was for me. That's privately. Okay, so I'll reach out to you, Antonio. But I did just want to acknowledge that question is there in the chat. And this was when we were talking about the ESG uh, this is when we were talking about what ESG means. So I'm, I'm assuming that his, his uh, question was in response to that. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I think that that definitely is worthy of more topic or more conversation at another time. Um, I am going to stop our recording now.